Zenobi said, I believe it is well, since the discussion ought to be changed, that Batista take up his office, and I resign mine. And in this case we would come to imitate the good captains, according as I have already learned here from the Lord, who place the best soldiers in the front and in the rear of the army, as it appears necessary to them to have those who bravely enkindle the battle, and those in the rear who bravely sustain it. Cosimo, therefore, begun this discussion prudently, and Battista will prudently finish it. Luigi and I have come in between these, and as each of one of us has taken up his part willingly, so too, I believe, Battista is about to close it. Battista said, I have allowed myself to be governed up to now, so too I will allow myself to be governed in the future. Be content, therefore, my lords, to continue your discussions, and if we interrupt you with these questions, you have to excuse us. Fabrizio said, You do me, as I have already told you, a very great favour, since these interruptions of yours do not take away my imagination, rather they refresh it. But if we want to pursue our subject, I say that it is now time that we quarter this army of ours, since you know that everything desires repose and safety, since to repose oneself and not to repose safely is not complete repose. I am afraid, indeed, that you should not desire that I first quarter them, then had them march and lastly to fight. And we have done the contrary. Necessity has led us to this, for in wanting to show when marching how an army turns from a marching formation to that of battle, it was necessary first to show how they were organised for battle. Uh, but returning to our subject, I say that if you want the encampment to be safe, it must be strong and organised. The industry of the captain makes it organised. Arts, or the sight, make it strong. The Greeks sought strong locations, and never took positions where there was neither caves or banks of rivers, or a multitude of trees, or other natural cover which should protect them. But the Romans did not encamp safely so much from the location as by arts, nor ever made an encampment in places where they should not have been able to spread out all their forces according to their discipline. From this resulted that the Romans were always able to have one form of encampment, for they wanted the site to obey them, and not they the site. The Greeks were not able to observe this, for as they obeyed the site, and the sites changing the formation, it behooved them that they too should change the mode of encamping, and the form of their encampment. The Romans, therefore, where the site lacked strength, supplied it with their art and industry. And since in this narration of mine I have wanted that the Romans be imitated, I will not depart from their mode of encamping, not, however, observing all their arrangements, but taking only that part which at the present time seems appropriate to me. I have often told you that the Romans had two legions of Roman men in their consular armies, which comprised some eleven thousand infantry of forces sent by friends or allies to aid them. But they never had more foreign soldiers in their armies than Romans, except for cavalry, which they did not care if they exceeded the number in their legions and that in every action of theirs they place the legions in the centre and the auxiliaries on the sides, which method they observed even when they encamped, as you yourselves have been able to read in those who write of their affairs. And therefore I am not about to narrate in detail how they encamped, but will tell you only how I would at present arrange to encamp an army, and then you will know what part of the Roman methods I have treated. You know that, at the encounter of two Roman legions, I have taken two battalions of six thousand infantry and three hundred cavalry effective for each battalion, and I have divided them by companies, by arms and names. You know that, in organising the army for marching and fighting, I have not made mention of other forces, but have only shown that in doubling the forces nothing else to be done but to double the orders or arrangements. Since, at present, I want to show you the manner of encamping, it appears proper to me not to stay only with two battalions, but to assemble a fair army, and compose, like the Roman, of two battalions and as many auxiliary forces. 
I know that the form of an encampment is more perfect when a complete army is quartered, which matter did not appear necessary to me in the previous demonstration. If I want, therefore, to quarter a fair-sized army of twenty-four thousand infantry and two thousand cavalry effectives, being divided into four companies, two of your own forces and two of foreigners, I would employ this method. When I had found the site where I should want to encamp, I would raise the captain's flag, and around it I would draw a square which would have each face distant from it fifty arm lengths, of which each should look out on to one of the four regions of the sky, uh, that is, east, west, south, and north, in which space I would put the quarters of the captain. And as I believe it prudent, and because thus the Romans did in good part, I would divide the armed men from the unarmed, and separate the men who carry burdens from the unburdened ones. I would quarter all or a great part of the armed men on the east side, and the unarmed and burdened ones on the west side, making the east the front, and the west the rear of the encampment, and the south and north would be the flanks. And to distinguish the quarters of the armed men I would employ this method. I would run a line from the captain's flag, and would lead it easterly for a distance of six hundred and eighty arm lengths. I would also run two other lines, which I would place in the middle of it, and be of the same length as the former, but distant from each of them by fifteen arm lengths, at the extremity of which I would want the east gate to be placed. And the space which exists between the two lines I would make a road that would go from the gate to the quarters of the captain, which would be thirty arm lengths in width, and six hundred and thirty long since the captain's quarters would occupy fifty arm lengths, and call this the captain's way. I would then make another road from the south gate up to the north gate, and cross by the head of the captain's way, and along the east side of the captain's quarters, which would be one thousand two hundred and fifty arm lengths long, since it would occupy the entire width of the encampment, and also be thirty arm lengths wide, and be called the cross way. The quarters of the captain and these two roads having been designed, therefore the quarters of the two battalions of your own men should begin to be designed. And I would quarter one on the right-hand side of the captain's way, and one on the left. And hence, beyond the space which is occupied by the width of the crossway, I would place thirty-two quarters on the left side of the captain's way, and thirty-two on the right, leaving a space of thirty arm lengths between the sixteenth and seventeenth quarters, which should serve as a transverse road which should cross through all of the quarters of the battalions, as will be seen in their partitioning. Of these two arrangements of quarters, in the first tents that would be adjacent to the crossway, I would quarter the heads of men-at-arms, and since each company has one hundred and fifty men-at-arms, there would be assigned ten men-at-arms to each of the quarters. The area of the quarters of the heads should be forty arm-lengths wide, and ten arm-lengths long. And it is to be noted that whenever I say width, I mean from south to north, and when I say length, that from west to east. Those of the men-at-arms should be fifteen arm-lengths long and thirty wide. In the next fifteen quarters, which in all cases are next, which should have their beginning across the transverse road, and which would have the same space as those of the men-at-arms, I would quarter the light cavalry which, since they are one hundred and fifty, ten cavalrymen would be assigned to each quarter, and in the sixteenth, which would be left, I would quarter their head, giving him the same space which is given to the head of men-at-arms. And thus the quarters of the cavalry of the two battalions would come to place the captain's way in the centre, and give a rule for the quarters of the infantry, as I will narrate. You have noted that I have quartered three hundred cavalry of each battalion, with their heads in thirty-two quarters situated on the captain's way. And beginning with the crossway, and that from the sixteenth to the seventeenth, there is a space of thirty arm lengths to make a transverse road. If I want, therefore, to quarter the twenty companies which constitute the two regular battalions, I would place the quarters of every two companies behind the quarters of the cavalry, each of which should be fifteen arm lengths long and thirty wide, as those of the cavalry and should be joined on the rear where they touch one another. 
and in every first quarter of each band that fronts on the crossway I would quarter the constable of one company, which would come to correspond with the quartering of the head of the men-at-arms, and their quarters alone would have a space twenty arm-lengths in width and ten in length. And in the other fifteen quarters in each group, which follow after this up the transverse way, I would quarter a company of infantry on each side, which, as they are four hundred and fifty, thirty would be assigned to each quarter. I would place the other fifteen quarters contiguous in each group to those of the cavalry with the same space, in which I would quarter a company of infantry from each group. In the last quarter of each group I would place the constable of the company, who would come to be adjacent to the head of the light cavalry, with a space of ten arm lengths long and twenty wide and thus these first two rows of quarters would be half of cavalry and half of infantry. And as I want, as I told you in its place, these cavalry to be all effective, and hence without retainers who help taking care of the horses or other necessary things, I would want these infantry quartered behind the cavalry to be obligated to help the owners of the horses in providing and taking care of them, and because of this should be exempt from other activities of the camp, which was the manner observed by the Romans. I would also leave behind these quarters, on all sides, a space of thirty arm-lengths to make a road, and I would call one the first road on the right-hand side, and the other the first road on the left, and in each area I would place another row of thirty-two double quarters, which should face one another on the rear with the same spaces as those which I have mentioned, and also divided at the sixteenth in the same manner to create a transverse road, in which I would quarter in each area four companies of infantry with the constables on the front at the head and foot of each row. I would also leave on each side another space of thirty arm lengths to create a road which would be called the second road on the right hand side, and on the other side the second road to the left. I would place another row in each area of thirty-two double quarters, with the same distances and divisions, in which I would quarter on every side four companies of infantry with their constables. And thus there would come to be quartered in each three rows of quarters per area the cavalry and the companies of infantry of the two regular battalions, in the centre of which I would place the captain's way. The two battalions of auxiliaries since I had them composed of the same men, I would quarter on each side of these two regular battalions, with the same arrangement of double quarters, placing first a row of quarters in which I would quarter half the cavalry and half infantry, distant thirty arm lengths from each other, to create two roads which I should call one the third road on the right hand side, the other the third road on the left hand. And then I would place on each side two other rows of quarters, separate but arranged in the same way as those of the regular battalions, which would create two other roads, and all of these would be called by the number and the band where they should be situated, so that all this part of the army would come to be quartered in twelve rows of double quarters, and on thirteen roads, counting the captain's way and the crossway. I would want a space of one hundred arm lengths all around left between the quarters and the ditch or moat and if you count all those spaces you will see that from the middle of the quarters of the captain to the east gate there are seven hundred arm lengths. There remains to us now two spaces, of which one is from the quarters of the captain to the south gate, the other from there to the north gate, each of which comes to be, measuring from the centre point, six hundred thirty-five arm lengths. I then subtract from each of these spaces fifty arm lengths, which the quarters of the captain occupies, and forty-five arm-lengths of plaza which I want to give to each side, and thirty arm-lengths of road which divides each of the mentioned spaces in the middle, and a hundred arm-lengths which are left on each side between the quarters and the ditch, and there remains in each area a space left for quarters four hundred arm-lengths wide and a hundred long, measuring the length to include the space occupied by the captain's quarters. Dividing the said length in the middle, therefore, there would be on each side of the captain forty quarters, fifty arm lengths long and twenty wide, which would total eighty quarters, in which would be quartered the general heads of the battalions, the chamberlains, the masters of the camps, 
and all those who should have an office in the army, leaving some vacant for some foreigners who might arrive, and for those who should fight through the courtesy of the captain. On the rear side of the captain's quarters I would create a road thirty arm lengths wide from north to south, and call it the front road, which would come to be located along the eighty quarters mentioned, since this road and the crossway would have between them the captain's quarters and the eighty quarters on their flanks. From this front road, and opposite the captain's quarters, I would create another road which would go from there to the west gate, also thirty arm lengths wide and corresponding in location and length to the captain's way, and I would call it the way of the plaza. These two roads being located, I would arrange the plaza where the market should be made, which I would place at the head of the way of the plaza, opposite to the captain's quarters, and next to the front road, and would want it to be square, and would allow it a hundred and twenty-one arm lengths per side and from the right hand and left hand side of the said plaza I would make two rows of quarters, and each row have eight double quarters, which would take up twelve arm lengths in length and thirty in width, so that they should be on each side of the plaza, in which there would be sixteen quarters, and total thirty-two altogether, in which I would quarter that cavalry left over from the auxiliary battalions, and if this should not be enough, I would assign them some of the quarters about the captain and especially those which face the ditch. It remains for us now to quarter the extraordinary pikemen and viliti, which every battalion has, according to our arrangement, in addition to the ten companies of infantry, a thousand extraordinary pikemen and five hundred viliti, so that the two regular battalions have two thousand extraordinary pikemen and a thousand extraordinary viliti, and the auxiliaries as many as they so that one also comes to have to quarter six thousand infantry, all of whom I would quarter on the west side along the ditches. From the point, therefore, of the front road and northward, leaving the space of a hundred arm lengths from those quarters to the ditch, I would place a row of five double quarters, which would be seventy-five arm lengths long and sixty in width, so that with the width divided each quarters would be allowed fifteen arm lengths for length and thirty for width. And as there would be ten quarters, I would quarter three hundred infantry, assigning thirty infantry to each quarters. Leaving then a space of thirty-one arm lengths, I would place another row of five double quarters in a similar manner, and with similar spaces, and then another, so that there would be five rows of five double quarters, which would come to be fifty quarters placed in a straight line on the north side, each distant one hundred arm lengths from the ditches and would quarter one thousand five hundred infantry. Turning then on the left-hand side towards the west gate, I would want in all that tract between them and the said gate five other rows of double quarters, in a similar manner and with the same spaces. It is true that from one row to the other there would not be more than fifteen arm lengths of space, in which there would also be quartered one thousand five hundred infantry, and thus from the north gate to that of the west, following the ditches, in a hundred quarters, divided into ten rows of five double quarters per row, the extraordinary pikemen and veliti of the regular battalions would be quartered. And so too from the west gate to that of the south, following the ditches, in exactly the same manner, in another ten rows of ten quarters per row, the extraordinary pikemen and veliti of the auxiliary battalions would be quartered. Their heads, or rather their constables, could take those quarters on the side towards the ditches, which appeared most convenient for themselves. I would dispose the artillery all along the embankments of the ditches, and in all the other spaces remaining towards the west I would quarter all the unarmed men and all the baggage or impedimenta of the camp. And it has to be understood that this name of impedimenta, the ancients intended all those carriages and wagons and all those things which are necessary to an army except the soldiers as are carpenters, smiths, blacksmiths, shoemakers, engineers, and bombardiers, and others which should be placed among the number of the armed, a herdsmen with their herds of castrated sheep and oxen, which are used for feeding the army, and, in addition, masters of every art or trade, together with public wagons for the public provisions of food and arms. And I would not particularly distinguish their quarters, I would only designate the roads that should not be occupied by them. 
Then the other spaces remaining between the roads, which would be four, I would assign in general to all the impedimenta mentioned, that is, one to the herdsmen, another to artificers and workmen, another to the public wagons for provisions, and the fourth to the armourers. The roads which I would want left unoccupied would be the way of the plaza, the front road, and in addition a road that should be called the centre road, which should take off at the north and proceed towards the south and pass through the centre of the way of the plaza, which on the west side should have the same effect as the transverse road on the east side. And in addition to this, a road that should go around the rear along the quarters of the extraordinary pikemen and Veliti. And all these roads should be thirty arm lengths wide, and I would dispose the artillery along the ditches on the rear of the camp. Batista said, I confess I do not understand, and I also do not believe that to say so makes me ashamed, as this is not my profession. Nonetheless, I like this organization very much. I would want only that you should resolve these doubts for me. The one, why you make the roads and spaces around the quarters so wide. The other, which annoys me more, is this, how are these spaces that you designate for quarters to be used? Fabrizio said, You know that I made all the roads thirty arm lengths wide, so that a company of infantry is able to go through them in order or formation. Which, if you remember well, I told you that each of these formations were twenty-five to thirty arm lengths wide. The space between the ditch and the quarters, which is a hundred arm lengths wide, is necessary, since the companies and the artillery can be handled there, through which booty is taken, and, when space is needed into which to retire, new ditches and embankments are made. The quarters very distant from the ditches are better, for they are more distant from the fires and other things that might be able to draw the enemy to attack them. As to the second question, my intention is not that every space designated by me is covered by only one pavilion, but is to be used as an all-round convenience for those who are quartered, with several or few tents, so long as they do not go outside its limits. And in designing these quarters, the men must be most experienced and excellent architects, who, as soon as the captain has selected the site, know how to give it form, and divide it, and distinguish the roads, dividing the quarters with cords and hatches, in such a practical manner that they might be divided and arranged quickly. And if confusion is not to arise, the camp must always face the same way, so that everyone will know on which road and in which space he has to find his quarters. And this ought to be observed at all times, in every place, and in a manner that it appears to be a movable city, which, wherever it goes, brings with it the same roads, the same houses, and the same appearance, which cannot be observed by those men who, seeking strong locations, have to change the form according to the variations in the sites. But the Romans made the places strong with ditches, ramparts, and embankments, for they placed a space around the camp and in front of it they dug a ditch, and ordinarily six arm-lengths wide and three deep, which spaces they increased according to the length of time they resided in the one place, and according as they feared the enemy. For myself I would not at present erect a stockade or rampart, unless I should want to winter in a place. I would, however, dig the ditch and embankment not less than that mentioned, but greater according to the necessity. With respect to the artillery, on every side of the encampment I would have a half-circle ditch, from which the artillery should be able to batter on the flanks whoever should come to attack the moats or ditches. The soldiers ought also to be trained in this practice of knowing how to arrange an encampment, and work with them so that they may aid him in designing it, and the soldiers quick in knowing their places. And none of these is difficult, as will be told in its proper place. For now I want to pass on to the protection of the camp, which, without the distribution or assignment of guards, all the other efforts would be useless. Batista said, Before you pass on to the guards, I would want you to tell me what methods are employed when others want to place the camp near the enemy, for I do not know whether there is time to be able to organise it without danger. Fabrizio said, you have to know this, that no captain encamps near the enemy unless he is disposed to come to an engagement whenever the enemy wants. And, if the others are so disposed, 
there is no danger except the ordinary, since two parts of the army are organised to make an engagement, while the other part makes the encampment. In cases like this, the Romans assigned this method of fortifying the quarters to the triari, while the principi and the astati remained under arms. They did this because the triari, being the last to combat, were in time to leave the work if the enemy came and take up their arms and take their places. If you want to imitate the Romans, you have to assign the making of the encampment to that company which you would want to put in the place of the triari in the last part of the army. But let us return to the discussion of the guards. I do not seem to find, in connection with the ancients guarding the camp at night, that they had guards outside, distant from the ditches, as is the custom today, which they called the watch. I believe I should do this when I think how the army could be easily deceived, because of the difficulty which exists in checking or reviewing them, for they may be corrupted or attacked by the enemy, so that they judged it dangerous to trust them entirely or in part and therefore all the power of their protection was within the ditches, which they dug with very great diligence and order, punishing capitally any one who deviated from such an order. How this was arranged by them I will not talk to you further, in order not to tire you, since you are able to see it by yourselves, if you have not seen it up to now. I will say only briefly what would be done by me. I would regularly have a third of the army remain armed every night, and a fourth of them always on foot, who would be distributed throughout the embankments and all the places of the army, with double guards posted at each of its squares, where a part should remain, and a part continually go from one side of the encampment to the other. And this arrangement I describe I would also observe by day if I had the enemy near. As to giving it a name, and renewing it every night, and doing the other things that are done in such guarding, since they are things already known, I will not talk further of them. I would only remind you of a most important matter, and by observing it do much good, by not observing it do much evil, which is that great diligence must be used as to who does not lodge within the camp at night, and who arrives there anew. And this is an easy matter to review who is quartered there with those arrangements we have designated, since every quarter having a predetermined number of men, it is an easy thing to see if there are any men missing or if any are left over, and when they are missing without permission, to punish them as fugitives, and if they are left over, to learn who they are, what they know, and what their conditions. Such diligence results in the enemy not being able to have correspondence with your heads, and not to have co-knowledge of your counsels. If this had not been observed with diligence by the Romans, Claudius Nero could not, when he had Hannibal near to him, have departed from the encampment he had in Lucania, and go and return from the marches, without Hannibal being aware of it. But it is not enough to make these good arrangements, unless they are made to be observed by great security, for there is nothing that wants so much observance as any required in the army. Therefore the laws for their enforcement should be harsh and hard, and the executor very hard. The Romans punished with capital penalty whoever was missing from the guard, whoever abandoned the place given him in combat, whoever brought anything concealed from outside the encampment. If anyone should tell of having performed some great act in battle, and should not have done it, if anyone should have fought except at the command of the captain, if anyone from fear had thrown aside his arms, and if it occurred that an entire cohort or an entire legion had made a similar error, in order that they not all be put to death, they put their names in a purse, and drew the tenth part, and those they put to death. Which penalty was so carried out that if every one did not hear of it, they at least feared it. And because where there are severe punishments, there also ought to be rewards, so that men should fear and hope at the same time, they proposed rewards for every great deed, such as to him who during the fighting saved the life of one of its citizens, to whoever first climbed the walls of enemy towns, to whoever first entered the encampment of the enemy, to whoever in battle wounded or killed an enemy, to whoever had thrown him from his horse, and thus any act of virtue was recognised and rewarded by the consuls, and publicly praised by everyone. And those who received gifts for any of these things, 
in addition to the glory and fame they acquired among the soldiers, when they returned to their country, exhibited them with solemn pomp and with great demonstrations among their friends and relatives. It is not to marvel, therefore, if that people acquired so much empire, when they had so great an observance of punishment and reward toward them, which operated either for their good or evil, should merit either praise or censure. It behoves us to observe the greater part of these things. And it does not appear proper for me to be silent on a method of punishment observed by them, which was, that as the miscreant was convicted before the tribune or the consul, he was struck lightly by him with a rod. After which striking of the criminal, he was allowed to flee, and all the soldiers allowed to kill him, so that immediately each of them threw stones or darts, or hit him with other arms, of a kind from which he went little alive, and rarely returned to camp. And to such that did return to camp, he was not allowed to return home, except with so much inconvenience and ignominy, that it was much better for him to die. You see this method almost observed by the Swiss, who have the condemned publicly put to death by the other soldiers, which is well considered and done for the best. For if it is desired that one be not a defender of the criminal, the better remedy that is found is to make him the punisher of him the criminal. For in some respects he favours him, while from other desires he longs for his punishment, if he himself is the executioner, than if the execution is carried out by another. If you want, therefore, that one is not to be favoured in his mistakes by a people, a good remedy is to see to it that the public judge him. In support of this, the example of Manlius Capital can be cited, who, when he was accused by the Senate, was defended so much by the public, up to the point where it no longer became the judge, but having become arbiter of his cause, condemned him to death. It is, therefore, a method of punishing this, of doing away with tumults, and of having justice observed. And since, in restraining armed men, the fears of laws and of men is not enough, the ancients added the authority of God. And therefore, with very great ceremony, they made their soldiers swear to observe the military discipline, so that if they did the contrary, they not only had to fear the laws and men, but God. And they used every industry to fill them with religion. Batista said, Did the Romans permit women to be in their armies? or that they indulge in indolent games that are used to-day. Fabrizio said, they prohibited both of them, and this prohibition was not very difficult, because the exercises which they gave each day to the soldiers were so many, sometimes being occupied altogether, sometimes individually, that no time was left for them to think either of venery or of games, or of other things which make soldiers seditious and useless. And Batista said, I like that. But tell me, when the army had to take off, what arrangements did they have? Fabrizio said, The captain's trumpet was sounded three times. At the first sound the tents were taken down and piled into heaps. At the second they loaded the burdens, and at the third they moved in the manner mentioned above, with the impedimenta behind, the armed men on every side, placing the legions in the centre and therefore you would have to have a battalion of auxiliaries move, and behind it its particular impedimenta, and with those the fourth part of the public impedimenta, which would be all those who should be quartered in one of those sections of the camp which we showed a short while back. And therefore it would be well to have each one of them assigned to a battalion, so that when the army moved every one should know where his place was in marching and every battalion ought to proceed on its way in this fashion, with its own impedimenta, and with a court of the public impedimenta at its rear, as we showed the Roman army marched. Batista said, In placing the encampment, did they have any other considerations than those you mentioned? Fabrizio said, I tell you again that in their encampments the Romans wanted to be able to employ the usual form of their method, and in the observance of which they took no other consideration. But as to other considerations, they had two principal ones. The one, to locate themselves in a healthy place, and to locate themselves where the enemy should be unable to besiege them and cut off their supply of water and provisions. To avoid this weakness, therefore, 
they avoided marshy places for exposure to noxious winds. They recognised these not so much from the characteristics of the site, but from the looks of the inhabitants, and if they saw them with poor colour, or short-winded, or full of other infections, they did not encamp there. As to the other part of not being besieged, the nature of the place must be considered, where the friends are and where the enemy, and from these make a conjecture whether or not you could be besieged and therefore the captain must be very expert concerning sights of the countries, and have around him many others who have the same expertness. They also avoided sickness and hunger, so as not to disorganise the army, for if you want to keep it healthy, you must see to it that the soldiers sleep under tents, that they are quartered where there are trees to create shade, where there is wood to cook food, and not to march in the heat. You need, therefore, to consider the encampment the day before you arrive there, and in winter guard against marching in the snow and through ice without the convenience of making a fire, and not lack necessary clothing, and not to drink bad water. Those who get sick in the house have them taken care of by doctors, for a captain has no remedy when he has to fight both sickness and the enemy. But nothing is more useful in maintaining an army healthy than exercise, and therefore the ancients made them exercise every day whence it is seen how much exercise is of value, for in the quarters it keeps you healthy, and in battle it makes you victorious. As to hunger, not only is it necessary to see that the enemy does not impede your provisions, but to provide whence you are to obtain them, and to see that those you have are not lost, and therefore you must always have provisions on hand for the army for a month, and beyond that to tax the neighbouring friends that they provide you daily keep the provisions in a strong place, and above all, dispense it with diligence, giving each one a reasonable measure each day, and so observe this part that they do not become disorganised. For every other thing in war can be overcome with time, this only with time overcomes you. Never make any one your enemy, who, while seeking to overcome you with the sword, can overcome you by hunger, because if such a victory is not honourable, it is more secure and more certain. That army, therefore, cannot escape hunger which does not observe justice, and licentiously consume whatever it please. For one evil causes the provisions not to arrive, and the other, that when they arrive, they are uselessly consumed. Therefore the ancients arranged that what was given was eaten, and in time they assigned so that no soldier ate except when the captain did, which, as to being observed by the modern armies, every one does the contrary, and deservedly they cannot be called orderly and sober as the ancients, but licentious and drunkards. Batista said, You have said in the beginning of arranging the encampment that you did not want to stay only with two battalions, but took up four, to show how a fair-sized army was quartered. Therefore I would want you to tell me two things. The one, if I have more or less men, how should I quarter them? The other, what number of soldiers would be enough to fight against any enemy? Fabrizio said, To the first question I reply that if the army has four or six thousand soldiers, more or less, rows of quarters are taken away or added as are needed, and in this way it is possible to accommodate more or fewer infinitely. Nonetheless, when the Romans joined together two consular armies, they made two encampments and had the parts of the disarmed men face each other. As to the second question, I reply that the regular Roman army had about twenty-four thousand soldiers, but when a great force pressed them, the most they assembled were fifty thousand. With this number they opposed two hundred thousand Gauls, whom they assaulted after the first war which they had with the Carthaginians. With the same number they opposed Hannibal, and you have to note that the Romans and Greeks had made war with few soldiers, strengthened by order and by art. The Westerners and Easterners have made it with a multitude, but one of these nations serves itself of natural fury, as are the Westerners, the other of the great obedience which its men show to their king. But in Greece and Italy, as there is not this natural fury, nor the natural reverence towards the king, it has been necessary to turn to discipline, which is so powerful that it made the few 
able to overcome the fury and natural obstinacy of the many. I tell you, therefore, if you want to imitate the Romans and Greeks, the number of fifty thousand soldiers ought not to be exceeded. Rather, they should actually be less, for the many cause confusion, and do not allow discipline to be observed, nor the orders learned. And Pyrrhus used to say that with fifteen thousand men he would assail the world. But let us pass on to another part. We have made our army win an engagement, and I showed the troubles that can occur in battle. We have made it march, and I have narrated with what impedimenta it can be surrounded while marching. And lastly we have quartered it, where not only a little repose from past hardship ought to be taken, but also to think about how the war ought to be concluded. For in the quarters many things are discussed, especially if there remain enemies in the field, towns under suspicion, of which it is well to reassure oneself and to capture those which are hostile. It is necessary, therefore, to come to these demonstrations, and to pass over this difficulty with that same glory with which we have fought up to the present. Coming down to particulars, therefore, that if it should happen to you that many men or many peoples should do something which might be useful to you and very harmful to them, as would be the destruction of the walls of their city, or the sending of many of themselves into exile, it is necessary that you either deceive them in a way that every one should believe he is affected, so that one not helping the other all find themselves oppressed without a remedy, or rather to command every one what they ought to do on the same day, so that each one believing himself to be alone, to whom the command is given, thinks of obeying it, and not of remedy, and thus without tumult your command is executed by every one. If you should have suspicion of the loyalty of any people, and should want to assure yourself and occupy them without notice, in order to disguise your design more easily, you cannot do better than to communicate to him some of your design, requesting his aid, and indicate to him that you want to undertake another enterprise, and to have a mind alien to every thought of his, which will cause him not to think of his defence, as he does not believe you are thinking of attacking him, and he will give you the opportunity which will enable you to satisfy your desire easily. If you should have present in your army someone who keeps the enemy advised of your designs, you cannot do better, if you want to avail yourself of his evil intentions, than to communicate to him those things you do not want to do, and to keep silent those things you want to do, and tell him you are apprehensive of the things of which you are not apprehensive, and conceal those things of which you are apprehensive, which will cause the enemy to undertake some enterprise in the belief he knows your designs, in which you can deceive him and defeat him. If you should design, as did Claudius Nero, to decrease your army, sending aid to some friend, and they should not be aware of it, it is necessary that the encampment be not decreased, but to maintain entire all the signs and arrangements, making the same fires and posting the same guards as for the entire army. Likewise, if you should attach a new force to your army, and do not want the enemy to know you have enlarged it, it is necessary that the encampment be not increased, for it is always most useful to keep your design secret. When Metellus, when he was with the armies in Spain, to one who asked him what he was going to do the next day, answered that if his shirt knew it, he would burn it. Marcus Crassus, to one who asked him when he was going to move his army, said, Do you believe you are alone in not hearing the trumpets? If you should desire to learn the secrets of your enemy, and know his arrangements, some used to send ambassadors, and with them men expert in war disguised in the clothing of the family, who, taking the opportunity to observe the enemy army, and consideration of his strengths and weaknesses, have given them the occasion to defeat him. Some have sent a close friend of theirs into exile, and through him have learned the designs of their adversary. You may also learn similar secrets from the enemy if you should take prisoners for this purpose. Marius, in the war he waged against Simbari, in order to learn the loyalty of those Gauls who lived in Lombardy and were leagued with the Roman people, sent them letters, open and sealed, and in the open ones he wrote them that they should not open the sealed ones except at such a time, and before that time he called for them to be returned, and finding them opened he knew their loyalty was not complete. 
Some captains, when they were assaulted, have not wanted to go to meet the enemy, but have gone to assail his country, and constrain him to return and defend his home. This often has turned out well, because your soldiers begin to win, and fill themselves with booty and confidence, while those of the enemy become dismayed, it appearing to them that from being winners they have become losers. So that to whoever has made this diversion it has turned out well but this can only be done by that man who has his country stronger than that of the enemy, for if it were otherwise he would go on to lose. It has often been a useful thing for a captain who finds himself besieged in the quarters of the enemy to set in motion proceedings for an accord, and to make a truce with him for several days, which only an enemy negligent in every way will do, so that availing yourself of his negligence you can easily obtain the opportunity to get out of his hands. Sulla twice freed himself from his enemies in this manner, and with this same deceit Hannibal in Spain got away from the forces of Claudius Nero, who had besieged him. It also helps one in freeing himself from the enemy to do something in addition to those mentioned which keeps him at bay. This is done in two ways, either by assaulting him with part of your forces, so that, intent on the battle, he gives the rest of your forces the opportunity to be able to save themselves, or to have some new incident spring up, which by the novelty of the thing makes him wonder, and for this reason to become apprehensive and stand still, as you know Hannibal did, who, being trapped by Fabius Maximus, at night placed some torches between the horns of many oxen, so that Fabius, in suspense over this novelty, did not think further of impeding his passage. A captain ought, among all the other actions of his, endeavour with every art to divide the forces of the enemy, either by making him suspicious of his men in whom he trusted, or by giving him cause that he has to separate his forces, and because of this become weaker. The first method is accomplished by watching the things of some of those whom he has next to him, as exists in war, to save his possessions maintaining his children, or other of his necessities, without charge. You know how Hannibal, having burned all the fields around Rome, caused only those of Fabius Maximus to remain safe. You know how Coriolanus, when he came with the army to Rome, saved the possessions of the nobles, and burned and sacked those of the plebs. When Metellus led the army against Jugurtha, all the ambassadors sent to him by Jugurtha were requested by him to give up Jugurtha as a prisoner. Afterwards, writing letters to these same people, on the same subject, wrote in such a way that in a little while Jugurtha became suspicious of all of his counsellors, and, in different ways, dismissed them. Hannibal, having taken refuge with Antiochus, the Roman ambassadors frequented him so much at home that Antiochus became suspicious of him, did not afterwards have any faith in his counsels. As to dividing the enemy forces, there is no more certain way than to have one country assaulted by part of your forces, so that being constrained to go and defend it, they of that country abandon the war. This is the method employed by Fabius when his army had encountered the forces of the Gauls, the Tuscans, Umbrians, and Samnites. Titus Didius, having a small force in comparison with those of the enemy, and awaiting a legion from Rome, the enemy wanted to go out to meet it, so that, in order that it should not do so, he gave out by voice throughout his army that he wanted to undertake an engagement with the enemy on the next day. Then he took steps that some of the prisoners he had were given the opportunity to escape, who carried back the order of the consul to fight on the next day, and caused the enemy, in order not to diminish his forces, not to go out to meet the legion, and in this way he kept himself safe which method did not serve to divide the forces of the enemy, but to double his own. Some, in order to divide the enemy forces, have employed allowing him to enter their country, and, in proof, allowed him to take many towns, so that by placing guards in them he diminished his forces, and in this manner, having made him weak, assaulted and defeated him. Some others, when they wanted to go into one province, feigned making an assault on another, and used so much industry that as soon as they extended toward that one where there was no fear they would enter, 
have overcome it before the enemy had time to succour it. For the enemy, as he is not certain whether you are to return back to the place first threatened by you, is constrained not to abandon the one place and succour the other, and thus often he does not defend either. In addition to the matters mentioned, it is important to a captain when sedition or discord arises among the soldiers to know how to extinguish it with art. The better way is to castigate the heads of this folly, but to do it in a way that you are able to punish them before they are able to become aware of it. The method is, if they are far from you, not to call only the guilty ones, but all the others together with them, so that as they do not believe there is any cause to punish them, they are not disobedient, but provide the opportunity for punishment. When they are present, one ought to strengthen himself with the guiltless, and by their aid punish them. If there should be discord among them, the best way is to expose them to danger, which fear will always make them united. But above all, what keeps the army united is the reputation of its captain, which only results from his virtue, for neither blood or birth or authority attain it without virtue. And the first thing a captain is expected to do is to see to it that the soldiers are paid and punished. For any time payment is missed, punishment must also be dispensed with, because you cannot castigate a soldier you rob unless you pay him. And as he wants to live, he can abstain from being robbed. But if you pay him but do not punish him, he becomes insolent in every way, because you become of little esteem, and to whomever it happens he cannot maintain the dignity of his position. And if he does not maintain it, of necessity tumults and discords follow, which are the ruin of an army. The ancient captains had a molestation from which the present ones are almost free, which was the interpretation of sinister omens to their undertakings. For if an arrow fell in the army, if the sun or the moon was obscured, if an earthquake occurred, if the captain fell while either mounting or dismounting from his horse, it was interpreted in a sinister fashion by the soldiers, and instilled so much fear in them that when they came to an engagement they were easily defeated. And therefore, as soon as such an incident occurred, the ancient captains either demonstrated the cause of it, or reduced to it to its natural causes, or interpreted it to favour their own purposes. When Caesar went to Africa, and having fallen while he was putting out to sea, said, Africa, I have taken you. And many have profited from an eclipse of the moon, and from earthquakes. These things cannot happen in our time, as much because our men are not as superstitious, as because our religion, by itself, entirely takes away such ideas. Yet, if it should occur, the orders of the ancients should be imitated. When, either from hunger or other natural necessity, or human passion, your enemy is brought to extreme desperation, and driven by it comes to fight with you, you ought to remain within your quarters, and avoid battle as much as you can. Thus the Lacedaemonians did against the Messinians. Thus Caesar did against Africanus and Petraeus. When Fulvius was consul against the Cimbri, he had the cavalry assault the enemy continually for many days, and considered how they would issue forth from their quarters in order to pursue them, whence he placed an ambush behind the quarters of the Cimbri, and had them assaulted by the cavalry, and when the Cimbri came out of their quarters to pursue them, Fulvius seized them and plundered them. It has been very effective for a captain, when his army is in the vicinity of the enemy army, to send his forces with the insignia of the enemy to rob and burn his own country. Whence the enemy, believing they were forces coming to their aid, also ran out to help them plunder. And because of this have become disorganised, and given the adversary the faculty of overcoming them. Alexander of Epirus used these means fighting against the Illyrici and Leptinus the Syracusan against the Carthaginians, and the design succeeded happily for both. Many have overcome the enemy by giving him the faculty of eating and drinking beyond his means, feigning being afraid, and leaving his quarters full of wine and herds, and when the enemy had filled himself beyond every natural limit, they assaulted him and overcame him with injury to him. Thus Tamirus did against Cyrus, and Tiberius Gracchus against the Spaniards. 
some have poisoned the wine and other things to eat in order to be able to overcome them more easily. A little while ago I said I did not find the ancients had kept a night watch outside, and I thought they did it to avoid the evils that could happen, for it has been found that sometimes the sentries posted in the daytime to keep watch for the enemy have been the ruin of him who posted them. For it has happened often that when they have been taken, and by force have been made to give the signal by which they called their own men, who, coming at the signal, have been either killed or taken. Sometimes it helps to deceive the enemy by changing one of your habits, relying on which he is ruined. As a captain had already done, who, when he wanted to have a signal made by his men indicating the coming of an enemy, as night with fire and in the daytime with smoke, commanded that both smoke and flame be made without any intermission, so that when the enemy came, he should remain in the belief that he came without being seen, as he had not seen the signals usually made to indicate his discovery, made, because of his going disorganised, the victory of his adversary easier. Menno Rhodius, when he wanted to draw the enemy from the strong places, sent one in the disguise of a fugitive, who affirmed that his army was full of discord, and that the greater part were deserting, and to give proof of this matter, had certain tumults started among the quarters, whence the enemy, thinking he was able to break him, assaulted him, and was routed. In addition to the things mentioned, one ought to take care not to bring the enemy to extreme desperation, which Caesar did when he fought the Germans, who, having blocked the way to them, seeing that they were unable to flee, and necessity having made them brave, desired rather to undergo the hardship of pursuing them if they defended themselves. Lucillus, when he saw that some Macedonian cavalry who were with him had gone over to the side of the enemy, quickly sounded the call to battle, and commanded the other forces to pursue it. Whence the enemy, believing that Lucillus did not want to start the battle, went to attack the Macedonians with such fury that they were constrained to defend themselves, and thus, against their will, they became fighters of the fugitives. Knowing how to make yourself secure of a town when you have doubts of its loyalty once you have conquered it, or before, is also important, which some examples of the ancients teach you. Pompey, when he had doubts of the Catanians, begged them to accept some infirm people he had in his army, and, having sent some very robust men in the disguise of infirm ones, occupied the town. Publius Valerius, fearful of the loyalty of the Epidorians, announced an amnesty to be held, as we will tell you, at a church outside the town, and when all the public had gone there for the amnesty, he locked the doors, and then let no one out from inside except those whom he trusted. Alexander the Great, when he wanted to go into Asia and secure Thrace for himself, took with him all the chiefs of this province, giving them provisions, and placed low-born men in charge of the common people of Thrace and thus he kept the chiefs content by paying them, and the common people quiet by not having heads who should disquiet them. But among all the things by which captains gain the people over to themselves are the examples of chastity and justice, as was that of Scipio in Spain when he returned that girl, beautiful in body, to her husband and father, which did more than arms in gaining over Spain. Caesar when he paid for the lumber that he used to make the stockades around his army in Gaul, gained such a name for himself of being just, that he facilitated the acquisition of that province for himself. I do not know what else remains for me to talk about regarding such events, and there does not remain any part of the matter that has not been discussed by us. The only thing lacking is to tell of the methods of capturing and defending towns, which I am about to do willingly, if it is not painful for you now. Batista said, Your humaneness is so great that it makes us pursue our desires without being afraid of being held presumptuous, since you have offered it willingly, that we would be ashamed to ask you. Therefore we say only this of you, that you cannot do a greater or more thankful benefit to us than to furnish us this discussion. But before you pass on to that other matter, resolve a doubt for us, whether it is better to continue the war even in winter, as is done to-day, or wage it only in summer, and go into quarters in the winter, as the ancients did. Fabrizio said, Here, if there had not been the prudence of the questioner, some part that merits consideration would have been omitted. 
I tell you again that the ancients did everything better and with more prudence than we, and if some error is made in other things, all are made in matters of war. There is nothing more imprudent or more perilous to a captain than to wage war in winter, and more dangerous to him who brings it than to him who awaits it. The reason is this. All the industry used in military discipline is used in order to be organised to undertake an engagement with your enemy, as this is the end towards which a captain must aim, for the engagement makes you win or lose a war. Therefore, whoever knows how to organise it better, who has his army better disciplined, has the greater advantage in this, and can hope more to win it. On the other hand, there is nothing more inimical to organisation than the rough sights or cold and wet seasons. For the rough sight does not allow you to use the plenitude of your forces according to discipline, and the cold and wet seasons do not allow you to keep your forces together, and you cannot have them face the enemy united, but, of necessity, you must quarter them separately and without order, having to take into account the castles, hamlets, and farmhouses that receive you, so that all the hard work employed by you in disciplining your army is in vain. And do not marvel if they war in winter time to-day, for as the armies are without discipline, and do not know the harm that is done to them by not being quartered together, for their annoyance does not enable those arrangements to be made and to observe that discipline which they do not have. Yet the injury caused by campaigning in the field in the winter ought to be observed, remembering that the French, in the year 1503, were routed on the Garigliano by the winter, and not by the Spaniards. For, as I have told you, whoever assaults has even greater disadvantage, because weather harms him more when he is in the territory of others, and wants to make war. Whence he is compelled either to withstand the inconvenience of water and cold in order to keep together, or to divide his forces to escape them. But whoever waits can select the place to his liking, and wait him, the enemy, with fresh forces, and can unite them in a moment, and go out to find the enemy forces who cannot withstand their fury. Thus were the French routed, and thus are those always routed who assault an enemy in winter time, who in itself has prudence. Whoever, therefore, does not want the forces, organisation, discipline, and virtue in some part to be of value, makes war in the field in the winter time. And because the Romans wanted to avail themselves of all these things, into which they put so much industry, avoided not only the winter time, but rough mountains and difficult places, and anything else which could impede their ability to demonstrate their skill and virtue. So this suffices to answer your question, and now let us come to treat of the attacking and defending of towns, and of sites, and of their edifices.